I'm delighted to introduce uh, Peter Boghossian. I have known about him only for a few years, but have been following him uh, and his, his activities um, and his, his remarkable uh, uh, principled stand against illiberalism in academia and elsewhere. Uh, and he probably needs almost no uh, introduction with this audience, but uh, I want to tell you a little bit more uh, about him. Uh, Dr. Bogosian is a founding faculty member at the University of Austin, Texas, a brand new university, uh, a founder and advisor to the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, the acronym for which is FAIR, F-A-I-R, and the director of National Progress Alliance. Peter has a teaching pedigree spanning more than 25 years that focuses on the Socratic method, scientific skepticism, and critical thinking. Peter's dissertation explored increasing the moral reasoning of prison inmates and aiding their desistance from crime. His most recent book is How to Have Impossible Conversations, and his writing can be found in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Philosopher's Magazine, Scientific American, Time Magazine, Skeptic, National Review, and elsewhere. His work is centered on bringing the tools of professional philosophers to a wide variety of contexts to help people think through what seem to be intractable uh, problems. His current work and activity can be found on Substack, Twitter, and his webpage, which is uh, uh, peterbergosian.com. I want to say one more word. Uh, Peter's books are for sale out in the lobby, and I encourage you to buy and read them. Uh, I think you will find them fascinating. Um, today, he will talk about how to have difficult conversations. Warm welcome, please, for Dr. Peter Boghossian. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. About five years ago, I received a phone call. The phone call was from someone whose voice I didn't recognize. And they said to me, your father has gone missing. So needless to say, I was, I was completely freaked out by this. I caught a plane. The next day, I, was, I live in Portland, Oregon, and my dad lives in Las Vegas. So I, ca I caught a plane the next day. Um, his car was found at a, uh, uh, a grocery store, like a Safeway. I didn't know what happened, so I had called all the hospitals, and he had been admitted to one of the hospitals in, in a, a, a section of the city where he lived. Soon after that, uh, two days after that, um, they found out, they didn't know what was wrong, but they found out that he had cancer and he died. And I was completely inconsolable. And, and, and if you've ever lost a parent, there's just literally nothing, nothing can prepare you for that. There's nothing you can do, there's nothing you can read. So, so I was a mess, I had no clothes, uh, I had the keys to his car, which someone dropped off at the hospital. So I would literally, I, I got in his car, and my mother had passed away two years before that, and I drove to his house, and fortunately I did not have to sleep in his bed, but I, I was wearing his clothes, I didn't know what to do. They had these, my, my parents had saved generations of photos uh, of people you know, my grandpa, so I'm looking through these photos. I have literally no idea what to do. It's like photos of my grandparents when they were younger. And I'm looking, I'm thinking at the time, I was like, I don't know, I'm 55 now, so 50. I'm thinking at the time, like, wow, I am now older than all of the people in these photos. So, um, so I didn't know what to do. So I lingered there and 
I don't know what would have happened to me unless a really good friend of mine took the initiative and he flew out and he said, let me help you. Let's get this in order. So um, he helped me put the house up for sale. He helped me pack the items. I just simply do not know from the bottom of my heart what I would have done if he did not come out and help me. Fast forward to a year later, I was sitting at breakfast with the same, my same friend Josh is his name. He's probably ideally su suited in retrospect because he was a psychiatrist and I was not doing well. I remember when the moment my dad died, I was just, you know, just sobbing and the, the woman in the hospital um, who was in the room said, you know, we, we have um, psychologists, people you can talk to on staff that they're available, <laughs> but for you, I would urge you, <laughs> I would urge you to do this, your special case. So, um, so I was having breakfast with my friend Josh and I told him about an audacious plan that I had. And the plan was basically to publish a bunch of fake papers in a journals to expose corruption. And Josh said to me, don't do it. Whatever you do, don't do it. And instead of listening to Josh and asking him why I shouldn't do it, I got in a defensive posture and I became belligerent and aggressive. Like here's a guy who literally came, who flew to Las Vegas to help me in the, probably the most difficult period or one of the most difficult periods of my life. And instead of actually listening to anything he had to say, I not only became defensive, but at some point in that conversation, I went to, into attack mode. Josh has never spoken to me since that day. I've reached out to him, I've texted him, I've called him, he hasn't returned my calls. Maybe he'll see this, I don't know, I can take him out for drinks, but. Um, the, the lesson, if you get nothing else from the talk today, I'm gonna tell you how to have impossible conversations with people. I'm gonna tell you about mistakes I've made so that, that you, won't, you won't make them. But if you get nothing else from this talk, we are situated at a unique time right now with polarization, fractionalization, the new ruling on Roe v. Wade is gonna make communication even more difficult. I will give you a single principle to think about. And that principle is, let friends be wrong. Someone doesn't have to believe exactly what you believe. And if someone has a different opinion than you, that's fine. Hear them out, listen to them, think about it. The deeper the gulf, moral, epistemological, political, the more important that listening phase is. So here's what I'm gonna do for my talk today. I'm gonna lay out a template from various forms of literature and I'll explain where each of these things come from in the literature. It's almost like a flow chart that will enable you to have a conversation with someone who has a radically different belief than you and you don't think it's possible to have that conversation. Those are extremely possible conversations. Okay, so let's, let's do it. The first stage, the first thing you wanna do when you meet someone, when you wanna have a conversation with them, is you need to build rapport. The rapport building phase usually takes about two minutes. Sometimes it can take three, sometimes it can take four. If you're ever wondering of a question to ask somebody, don't ask them what they do for work. Nobody wants to talk about their work. It just keeps the conversation at one level. Ask them what they do for fun. People love to talk about what their hobbies are, their activities are. It's a great rapport building. We also live in a society right now, without riding this hobby horse for too long, where we've taught a generation of people to look for oppression variables and oppression characteristics in people, to dig down into ever more granular niches. Oh, this person's gay or this person's white. 
or this person has some oppression variable, they're gay or trans, I'm gonna suggest exactly the opposite. Instead of looking for differences among people with whom you're speaking, look for commonalities. Oh, this person lives in my city. Oh, this person likes, I like science fiction. This person likes science fiction. I like jujitsu. This person does jujitsu. You can usually tell if someone has, like my ears are cauliflowered, you can usually tell. But, but there are things that you can do to build rapport and build commonalities among people. It takes a few minutes. The longer, the deeper the gulf, politically, epistemologically, morally, the more time you want to spend rapport building to let them get to know you as a person. The second thing you want to do is, people think that they can do this, they think they're good at it. Study after study has shown that that's actually not the case. You really want to listen. Like, truly, genuinely listen. And if you don't understand something somebody is saying, put the burden of clarity on yourself. Never a word of criticism, no criticism at all, until you've understood. Now, how do you know you've understood? Very simple. You know you've understood when you repeat it back to them. And this, this um, technique or trick or what you're gonna look for comes from hostage negotiations. Hostage negotiate, people have written entire books about this. They look for two single words. That's right. Those are the words, that's right. Having a conversation with someone, you've just built rapport, you've listened, you're repeating back to them, you're, getting, you're looking for that's right. You're not, you're not always gonna get it. In fact, maybe my, my rate of getting it is around 20, 25% at best. If you get, yeah, okay, yeah, that's good, take it, <clears throat> okay. You build rapport, you've listened, Here's what I do at 55 that I wouldn't have done at 25. At 55, my, far more of my life is behind me than in front of me. So I have to be judicious in my time. I can't, I can't screw around. Um, there's a technique that you can use that I, this is really, it's like magic when you get good at this. It's called scales. Ask someone to put their belief on a scale. On a scale from one to 10, how confident are you in that belief? Because you now know, because you've repeated back to them and they've said, yes, you've understood me correctly. How confident are you in that? A scale from one to 10, with one being I'm not, I'm zero, you know, not confident at all, five being you know, so, so confident, seven being quite confident, and 10 being I'm absolutely positive. So. It is remarkable what you can do with scales. I'll just give you a few examples. One thing you can do with scales, it will avoid a yes you can, no you can't situation. Or yes it is, no it isn't. I'll give you an example. Um, let's say that somebody says to you, a, a, a phrase that I hear frequently, the United States is a patriarchy. So instead of saying yes it is, no it isn't, yes it is, no it isn't, here's a way to get around that. Oh. So you always want to say, when someone makes a claim, you never, you, you, I'm talking about later, building a golden bridge. You never want to shut them down. You want to create a context and an environment for them where they're free to walk across the golden bridge. So when someone makes a claim, never a defensive posture, always an open, but physically open and cognitively and intellectually open. So someone makes a claim, first thing I always, the thing that my go-to is, that's interesting. Because if you say that's interesting, you're not agreeing with them, you're just saying it's interesting. Almost anything, any claim anybody tells you is gonna be interesting anyway. So, so someone would say something in the United States is a patriarchy, oh, that's interesting. On a scale from one to 10, if Saudi Arabia is a nine, where's the United States? That avoids immediately, yes it is, no it isn't. Now, the great thing about everything I'm gonna to say today is there are only so many things people can say to you. I learned that from the atheist movement, arguments for the existence of God. There's only so many things people can say to you. So somebody can say to you, <clears throat> well, uh, if Saudi Arabia is a nine, the United States is a seven. Okay, you know exactly where they stand. <laughs> Someone could say to you, well, Saudi Arabia is a nine, the United States is a 10. Um, then you need to decide whether or not you want to stay in that conversation. Um, someone could also say to you, I, I don't know. Like I, I really, I have no idea. I don't know the first thing about Saudi Arabia. As a rule, not even as a general rule, when someone says to you, I don't know, you should always compliment them. Thank you. 
We always want to reward people for not pretending to know things they don't know. Okay, so let's say the United States in the 1950s. In the 1950s, if the United States on a scale from one to the patriarchy scale was a seven, where are we now? And they'll tell you, I don't know, five, seven, nine, they'll tell you what they'll tell you. But asking people to put things on a scale, that's one thing you can do. Here's some other things you can do. When you start practicing the techniques in the book, and they're so, they truly are very easy to use. When you start practicing these, the physicist Richard Feynman says, the easiest person to fool is yourself. I use this to, to, to use it as a verb, to science it. At the beginning of the conversation, I'll say, oh, well, how confident are you in this claim? They'll give me a number. And at the very end of the conversation, I'll ask them the same question again, and I'll see where their confidence level has moved. So that way, I won't have to be telling myself, oh, I'm a great conversationalist, or it's a way to keep your delusions in check. You, you can do some remarkable things with scales. They're very, very counterintuitive, but once you put that and always front load that in your conversations. In other words, use those right after you've asked. Um, you've repeated, you build rapport, you've repeated, they've said something. Here's another thing you can do with scales. Let's say that somebody tells you, <clears throat> uh, I usually don't like the abortion thing because there's so many beliefs that populate the structure of that, but some of the things like immigration or what have you, how confident are you the United States should build a wall on the border? It doesn't matter what it is. They'll give you a number. Let's say that they give you the number seven. I'm seven confident that the United States needs a large wall across its southern border. Okay, this took me 20 years to figure out. Publications, thousands of people talking, tens of thousands, different contexts, prisons, etc. If you ask somebody why they believe something, the overwhelming majority of people are going to tell you why they believe it. Almost nobody will tell you to screw yourself. They're going to say exactly why they believe it. It's a great question. It's Socrates' question. I don't mean to demean the question at all. But it comes at a cost. The cost of asking someone why they believe something means that they're going to tell you. And they listen to what they tell you, and they increase the confidence in what they believe. I'm going to suggest in a moment, a completely different question to ask that will shatter the way that people conceptualize their own belief structure. But to do that, you need a scale. You need to know where somebody is on the one to 10. And, oh, by the way, and if someone says to you, you know what, I don't wanna use scales, I don't like scales, then don't use it, just go with the flow. Or someone says, I don't wanna use that scale, People have said to me, that's not granular enough. I want to use a one to 100 scale. Okay, that's great, great. Okay, no problem, no problem. Okay, so it's counterintuitive, but if someone says to you, I'm for, for, for building a wall on the Mexican border, I'm a seven, ask them, oh, that's interesting. Did I, I phased out? How's my mic? Good, I think I phased out for a second. Um, if somebody says to you, I'm a seven on a one to 10, don't say to them, oh, that's interesting. Why aren't you an eight or a nine? For the same reason I just, because if you say, why aren't you eight or a nine, they'll talk themselves into it. You need to do exactly the opposite. Oh, that's interesting. Why aren't you a five? And then they'll give you reasons against their own position. Really think about that. Let that percolate for a second. Okay. So. I can talk more about, I could talk, literally talk a day about scales, but those are some of the quick things you can do about, with scales. Here's something else you can think about. So rapport, repeating back to someone, looking for that's right, but getting it. Scales, the one thing that, that, that I found to be incredibly helpful and I would suggest that you do this, have these conversations exactly in the order I'm presenting today, is you ask somebody a disconfirmation question. So remember I said before, well, why do you believe that? I almost never ask people that anymore. It's not only is it a total waste of time, but it makes the conversation worse. But you, know, you can adapt to your conversations however you wanna 
adapt to them. When someone gives you a number, I said, well, why aren't you a lower number? And I'm always ending each of these things, just like the lesson from Socrates, it's always ending in a question. When you ask a disconfirmation question, here's a way to frame, you're asking people to disconfirm. This comes from the literature and philosophy on, on applied epistemology. It's the real name, I call it disconfirmation, but the real name in the literature is defeasibility. These are defeasibility questions. Here's the question that I want, want you to ask everyone next time you're having a difficult, if not impossible, conversation. Oh, that's interesting. What would it take to change your mind? If you're speaking to someone who's a little more educated, you would say, oh, that's interesting. Under what conditions would you be willing to revise that belief? Let me repeat that, that's so important. Under what conditions would you be willing to revise your belief? Because remember, that's almost exactly the opposite question of why do you believe that? Because why do you believe that? People just talk themselves, people just increase the confidence on the scales. You're asking somebody else, you're asking someone, you're not telling anybody anything. If you've noticed, I haven't told anybody anything. I'm just simply asking people, why do you believe that? No? Oh, okay. Under what conditions could that be wrong? How confident are you in that? One of the problems that we have is that we look at the conclusions that someone utters and we try to attack those conclusions. But I'm suggesting a completely different way to have a conversation across a divide. And that is to think about, to first understand the claim, what you're talking about, and to see if the reasoning somebody has justifies the confidence in their beliefs. And if you've seen the videos that I just put out, I do this on college campuses where I put painter's tape on a sidewalk and we look at a claim and then I encourage people, I, I see if the reasoning that they have justifies the confidence in their claim. You know, strongly agree, agree, mildly agree, neutral, strongly disagree, etc. Okay, so let's go back to the disconfirmation question or defeasibility question. <coughs> Excuse me. Under what conditions would you be willing to revise that belief? There are only four things people can say to you. There's not much. That's why I'm telling you. Just when you don't, don't do anything radical when you first learn how to do this. Just stick to the template. Later on, you can put stuff in, you can play with it, you can manipulate it. But for now, just follow the template. The first thing they can say to you is, there are no conditions. I'm completely unwilling to revise my belief. The person who says that would have answered 10 on the scale. Remember we talked about scales? That would have been a 10 on a 1 to 10. Here's the response to that. Oh, that's, that's interesting. So that belief isn't formed on the basis of evidence. Well, they say, well, what, what do you mean it's not formed on the basis of evidence? Well, to, form, to, to make a belief, to form a belief on the basis of evidence means, by definition, that there has to be some other evidence that could come in that would cause you to change your mind. And if you're not willing to change your mind, then the belief is in form of the base of evidence. So I'm curious, how are you coming to that conclusion? Here's a key when you ask people that question. Often when we have conversations with someone, we don't want people to feel uncomfortable and we just jump in. Don't jump in. This is what I do. And I'll just... If I have to stand there for a minute, I'll stand there for a minute. Two minutes, three minutes, five. I will not be the person who says something. The Greeks call that aporia, wonder. Those pregnant pauses engender a sense of wonder in people. Oh, and b by the way, just parenthetically, it's important to note, every single thing I'm saying today, the purpose of this is not to create confusion, wonder, in people, but th those things might come about as a, as a consequence of people examining their own beliefs. Just a very, very quick story. Um, I, I uh, used to teach critical thinking, and one of the things that I used to do is I used to ask people what would happen if you dropped an egg from a two-story window. <laughs> people, people would look at me like I had lost my mind, and they say, the, the, um, the egg will break. Not if it's dropped onto cement, but if it's dropped onto grass. 
And so what, what I would do is I would go get a dozen of eggs, but they couldn't be the eggs, the shells that you know, those super thin ones that you just do this. You know, Buckminster Fuller designed the geodesic dome on the base of an egg. If you drop an egg from a two-story, we can do it. You can do it out here, you can do it anywhere. I've done it literally ten, thousands of times. You drop it, as long as it's a, you know, not one of those super flimsy eggshells, and you, you drop it onto grass, the eggshell will not break. Now, people will be confused about that. But the purpose is not to confuse people. So there's a difference when Socrates does the, the Socratic method. The purpose is not to confuse people. The purpose is to help them re-examine their own beliefs. But confusion or perplexity, more specifically, will come as a consequence of people being honest with themselves and examining their own beliefs. Because remember, most people will walk through their whole lives and nobody, literally nobody will ever ask them, under what conditions would you be willing to change your mind? What they will ask them is, why do you believe that? And they'll have very, very, very well rehearsed um, lines or statements for their conclusions, but literally nothing for their epistemology. They'll have no way of engaging that. Okay, so you built rapport. You repeated something back to people. Oh, in the rapport building stage, you can also bring that in, those examples. If you can think of any other examples, Again, just from the ones I use, science fiction or jujitsu, whatever your hobbies are, objectivism, doesn't matter what it is. You can perhaps bring those up later in the conversation. You ask people to put their belief on a scale. You ask people what it, be, what it would take to change their mind. One of the four things that people said to you was, nothing will change my mind. The other thing that someone can say to you is, Evidence. Evidence would change my mind. Oh, that's interesting. What evidence? And they'll tell you. That's the ideal situation. The ideal situation is someone will tell you exactly what changed your mind, and then you see if you can provide that evidence. But don't do that yet. We're getting there. <laughs> the third thing that somebody can say to you is, geez, I, I really don't know. I've never thought about it before. I have no idea what would change my mind. And the re response to that should always be thank you. That's a great response. That's what I always say. That's a great response. That's a terrific response. If we all did that more, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in right now. We wouldn't have ideologues walking around pretending to know things they don't know. Okay. The fourth thing that someone can say to you is the final thing someone can say to you. They can tell you something wildly implausible. Um, when I was heavily involved in the atheist movement, I would ask people who would profess a belief in a deity, for example, a, a, a Christ, I would say, under what conditions would you be willing to change your mind that Christ was the Son of God? And smart apologists, apology, apology means you know, defense of the face, 1 Peter 3.15, you know, just defend. People would say, the bones of Christ. You present me with the bones of Christ, because if you presented them with the bones of Christ, that would mean that Christ didn't resurrect to heaven, so the resurrection narrative would fall. So someone can present you with something wildly implausible. I just want to take a pause and build off of a comment that I made during the panel. Let's say that you're having, I'm having that conversation. I'll, put, I'll place it on myself. Let's say that I'm having a conversation with somebody and someone says, the, bone, the bones of Christ. And I say, well, this is a remarkable coincidence. I've come from the Holy Land. I just spent two weeks there, and I plop a big bag down in front of them. <laughs> they would do absolutely everything in their power to disconfirm that those were the bones of Christ. Take it to universities, radiometric dating, you name it, they would do it. That tells you that the belief is not held for epistemological reasons. It's, in other words, it's not a problem of critical thinking. People hold their beliefs not for epistemic reasons, but for moral reasons. That's a huge pill to swallow. And unless, I've spent most of my professional life thinking about that. In fact, when you look, if you do watch the videos, and maybe next time we can do a seminar when we put painter's tape, my team and I put painter's tape, remember how we told you ask people to stand in line, you will find if you ask people enough, like enough questions asked in a sincere way about their beliefs, 
The only reason people stand on a particular line, the only reason that people have confidence in their beliefs is nothing to do with evidence, literally nothing. It has everything to do with morality. People hold beliefs for moral reasons, not epistemological ones. It's a huge pill to swallow. Okay, so you've just asked someone a disconfirmation question. We know there are only four things people can say to you. They can say they're not willing to change their mind, which means their belief isn't based on evidence. They can tell you exactly what it would take to change your mind, and you see if you can provide that. But we'll come back to that. They'll say, I don't know, in which case you should always I literally say thank you. Thank you for being honest. I really appreciate that. I always make sure I linger on that for a moment. Or they can give you some wildly implausible claim, like the bones of Christ. I want to take a second, and I want to... <clears throat> I want to drill down on some specific techniques that you can use throughout these conversations. There was a study, this is really interesting. There was a study of, of um, researchers asked people how confident they were in how toilets worked. And universally, every single person who was asked how a toilet works gave, they, they didn't use a scale, but they said, I'm extremely confident. I'm very, very confident. I know exactly how a toilet works. But when they asked people, describe in as much detail as you can about how a toilet works, people couldn't do it. Their confidence level was then, then plummeted. When you ask people to describe in tremendous detail, oh, well, let's talk about, to use an example I gave, let's talk about the healthcare policy or, or the wall. Like, how much would it cost? What would the wall be built out of? I mean, you could generate the questions, but ask people to describe in as much detail as possible. And this works very well with empirical phenomena, facts about the world. Just as an aside, I'm a very boring person. I never do anything but work. Um, but my um, jujitsu teacher, who's a good friend of mine, invited me to his house. This is a true story for a party. And uh, I never go out, but I had just read the original article about toilets. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome. I'm, I'm going to like try this and see if it works. <laughs> so the, the first guy I walked up to, I did the rapport building phrase, basically did stuff in my own book. And I said, hey, man, I'm just curious. How confident are you and how you know, the, how a toilet works. He said, I'm totally confident. I said, oh yeah, how well does a toilet work? <laughs> Turns out the guy was a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> he, gave, he gave this incredibly, he became a really good friend of mine, actually. We played Dungeons and Dragons together every Saturday. <laughs> he, he gave this incredibly detailed response about how a toilet works. But the great thing about that was that I got a free lesson. So it is possible that you're in a conversation and you have a belief yourself and you're asking someone about these questions and then you ap actually happen to come across an expert in something. Okay, so when you're stuck, ask people in, to explain to you in extreme detail. The other thing I, you can do is I ask people, what experts on the other side do you disagree with but respect their opinion? Now, most people, when you ask them that question, they haven't actually read anybody on the other side. It's made worse in our media ecosystem today. Some people will give you an, an answer. And then you can change the question, okay, well, let's say you might not have to agree with them, but who on the other side do you think has a solid voice on this? Now, you can pretty much gauge, at this point in the conversation, you should know where you are. But if they tell you someone like Sean Hannity or someone who's not really, who's just kind of a, cultural critic or ideologue, that will, give you, that will give you an idea. But most people can't name three people on the other side of the equation. Okay. So while you're doing this, while you're talking to someone, while you're engaging in this process, one thing that I highly recommend doing, this is extraordinarily difficult to do. I'm not, I'm not good at it at all. I can explain it in two minutes. It's very, very difficult to do. But tr don't believe, try it yourself, see if it works. Um, this comes from improv improvisational comedy. The technique is called yes-anding. Um, 
when you yes and somebody, someone says something and you're saying yes and, you're not saying no but. Every time you say but, I think it was a Tyrell Lannister from the Game of Thrones said nothing that comes after the but matters. Right? Nothing. You can, if you close your eyes, you can actually feel when someone says, yeah, I think we should have a wall, but boom. Yes, I think we should have a, a wall and. Yes, I, I think that your arguments about building a wall on the Mexican border were good, but every time you butt somebody, or you, you can butt yourself all you want, but every time you use but in a conversation, the consequence is it, it raises the defensive posture. And the whole goal of these conversations is to lower the, def- lower the heat, lower the defensive posture. So you can think about that as a technique, but I will say it's extreme. I, 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 I can't do it. I make mistakes all the time. Uh, it's very, very, very difficult to do because we have a lifetime and we traffic in the word but in ordinary conversation constantly. Okay. So you can use the, who are the experts on the other side? You can ask people um, to explain in as great detail as possible what they mean. And again, if you don't understand whatever those details are, make sure you place the burden of understanding on yourself. Never say to someone, that's unclear. Say to someone, I'm not sure I understand. What do you mean by that? Okay. And then you can try the but. Don't but somebody, yes and them. So just that template alone should give you enough meat that you can engage somebody across a divide. And when in doubt, just go back to listening mode. Always listening mode is someone's confidence in their belief justified for why they believe in. And even in the listening mode, Here's a wonderful thing to say, but you have to be a little careful with it because some people, it's because it's overused. But you have to gauge, you have to be a little savvy in your conversations. If I really want to let people know, this is also from hostage negotiations, hostage negotiations and ones from um, psychology. I'll, I'll use what's called a min- minimal encourager. So a minimal encourager would be someone would say something to me and I'll take the last few words of the thing they say to me and I'll repeat it back to them. And that's it. No commentary, nothing else. So if someone says, oh, you know, my boss at work today, and he was a, he was a, he, he was a real ass. He didn't let me, you know, he, he, cut your, he cut my break eight minutes short. Minimal encourager. Eight minutes short. Eight minutes short. Yeah, eight minutes. And then the person will go on. Sometimes people just want to be heard. That's it. They don't want to be And by the way, when you post on social media, People usually, the research shows, people post on on social media not because they want robust conversations, it depends on the platform, certainly not Twitter, but because they want their ideas and opinions out there and they want those ideas and opinions validated. Okay, so you can use a minimal encourager. You can use, and I do this very rarely, but I do this sometimes, you can use a I hear you. It's a very powerful, but I think it's a little overused. That's why I use it very frequently. So you have to know, let people know throughout the conversation that they're being heard. <coughs> Excuse me. One other thing that you can do when you're having these conversations is you, you have to give people the opportunity to change their mind and make it a value. Make it a value for change your mind. The Harvard Negotiation Project calls this, I referenced it before, building a golden bridge. You want to build a golden bridge. Here's the opposite of a golden bridge. You're having a conversation with somebody, he says something, and you say, man, it took you long enough to figure that out. Okay? So you can feel, everybody can feel last, I didn't mean to be funny, I meant to be, like, you can actually feel in somebody, you can feel in yourself what that would say. Or... God, you're so fucking stupid. (laughs) Um, So what you want to do is you want to give the opportunity to build a golden bridge for the person to walk across and change their mind. Here's an example of a golden bridge. Yeah, it's super difficult. I had trouble with it as well. I completely did that, but I didn't know X, Y, and Z. 
Do you also, did you see when I said I didn't know X, Y, and Z, that brings it from the moral to the epistemological? You always want to bring it back to the epistemological, how people know as opposed to you sh good people believe this, I am a good person, I, I believe this. That's very, the more moral a belief is, the more difficult it is to, for someone to revise their beliefs. Okay, so we're working on a template. We have specific techniques. We've gone over not budding someone. We've gone over specific details of things you can ask somebody. We've gone over building a golden bridge, giving someone an opportunity to cross the golden bridge to change their mind. The highest level of this, if you want the uh, boss level, if you will, uh, Craig used an expression that I loved last night, uh, leveling up. If you want to level yourself up, uh, particularly in hard mode, the ultimate thing Socrates in the Gorgias says, it is better to be refuted than it is to refute. That is the greater gain of the two. So if you're having a conversation with somebody, the same things that apply to them apply to you. You changing your mind about something is the best possible situation, the best possible outcome, because you then no longer harbor a false belief about the nature of reality. What could be better than that? It's like an intellectual delight. So one thing you'll find that people almost never do is change their mind in real time. That's why, for example, uh, Mormons, when they send missionaries to the door, they send them in twos. There's some really interesting veins of literature um, in, Mormon in Mormon missionaries about um, how to convert people to the faith. My first book, by the way, was about how to deconvert people from faith. Uh, but to do that, I had to read an incredible amount of literature um, about converting people. Okay. Oh, and by the way, just to be completely clear about something, when you're doing this well, you're not giving anybody your opinion, you're not making any assertions. This is called street epistemology. People, have, people are far better at it than I am. You can watch these videos online. Anthony Magnabosco has a wonderful thousands of videos. Read Nice Wonder, Curio, uh, Cordial Curiosity. So people basically take booths and they use the techniques from my books and um, they talk to people about contentious issues, difficult issues. Okay, so let's do a little summary. I want to make sure that I'm pounding home all of the points so that people walk out here and they can immediately use something that's actionable. You build rapport, ask people what they do for fun. If something's bothering you, whatever, as a general rule, I found, um, my general rule is I always just talk about what's on my mind. Uh, although a lot of people get sick of hearing about jujitsu and science fiction. I know my, my team who's back there doesn't want to hear me talk about the people walking around with Taekwondo black belts anymore. <clears throat> I think they've had it with me. But as a general rule, I, I think a kind of authenticity in your relationships is if you just talk about what's on your mind and when someone talks to you about what's on their mind, you sincerely engage. Sincerity is the key to this whole thing. So you're building rapport. You're asking them to put it on a scale. We know there are four things that people can say to you on the scale. You're asking a defeasibility or disconfirmation question. During the whole time, you're building bridges, golden bridges. You're asking for detailed explanations. You're attempting to not use but. You probably will, but forgive yourself if you do. You're engaging people. Okay, so we're now at a crossroads in the conversation. It could be that the gulf is just incommensurable. In other words, it could be that they believe something about an economic system that you simply don't believe, uh, and the way to adjudicate that, it's not really a, a dispute, but it's a worldview. Worldviews are much more difficult to, to adjudicate than matters of fact, because within that view, there are multiple, it's populated by suites of beliefs, multiple propositions that underline the belief. That's why the abortion issue is so difficult because it deals with so many other issues beneath it. It's like, a, it's like an architectonic structure. It's like a big house and you have big beams. And if abortion is the top, is the conclusion, the epistemology is a bunch of different beams in the house supporting it. So even if you're successful in helping somebody question 
one of the beams, the abortion belief in particular is held up by all these other re moral reasons, legal reasons, um, what, re what people think are reasons that constitute sufficient justification for the belief. Okay. So you're, it could be that the conversation is incommensurable. The, I just got back from a, I just got back from a couple of weeks in Dallas, with the, the University of Austin, which is a new university. And uh, one of the things that was remarkable to me about that experience was how, and Craig mentioned this yesterday at dinner, how, um, how wonderful it was to have conversations with people who disagree with us in a civil way. And the panel that we did yesterday was about civility. Civility is underrated despite what Chris, Christopher Hitchens might have said about it. When you're civil with somebody, not only can you figure out what they mean, but you have an opportunity to figure out what you mean. Here's the problem with this and why I think that the having an impossible conversation is so important right now. It is, not only is it difficult to have these conversations, but they're not being modeled for us in our academic institutions. In fact, they're being almost exactly the opposite as being modeled. The consequence of that is, think about this. Nobody knows what anybody else actually means. Nobody knows what anybody else believes. And if you don't know what someone else believes, you could never form an authentic relationship with them because you're only going off of what you think they mean and believe. And they don't know what you believe. And if you do that long enough, you won't even know what you believe. So you have to have honest, authentic relationships in conversations where there's legitimate give and take. And those criticisms that you receive, deflecting them or Engaging them as personal attacks is always the wrong way to go. So I want to leave a couple minutes for questions, but I want to bring it back to the original story of my friend Josh. I told you I haven't seen Josh or talked to Josh, but I'm going to text Josh tonight. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that those years in between will have, and I'm going to apologize again, I've apologized. As long as your apology is sincere to someone who's your friend and in a conversation, even if it does, and I've lost a lot of friends because of the stuff that I've been doing recently, the anti-woke stuff, the anti-critical justice stuff, the pro-building, the people are even upset about the building of a new university. I think that the vital thing in all of those relationships, let's say you, you, you're, you're going through the template, you're forming it, it's going great, you feel really good about it, and there's still a difference, guess what, like that's okay. And that's a main deliverable of the talk today is that you can let friends be wrong. You don't have to agree with everything everybody says for them to be in your life. In fact, I, I realize, I will acknowledge for younger people in the audience, this is like, I mean, you can literally find anybody with gray hair and you can ask them in this audience. And you can say, when you grew up, did your friends did your parents have different friends of different beliefs? And virtually everybody, if not everybody in the audience will say yes to that, right? I see the people with gray hair nodding, right? My parents had Democrats, they had Republicans, a green one, one of the guys kind of this is weird socialist, but we, we break off, Cushing writes about this in the big sort, we break off into increasingly um, fractured ideological tribes made worse by social media. So if someone doesn't believe exactly what you believe, that's okay. You can actually have a great friendship with, with a robust um, ways of engaging people, and you can actually learn more. So you can let your friends be wrong. In fact, I would argue if you have friends who don't believe exactly what you believe, and you have those conversations, that's the only way that you can have a, a, an actual authentic relationship, because nobody is pretending anything. Nobody is pretending to believe things they don't believe. Nobody is pretending to know things that they don't know. You know, my, my parents, I was fortunate, I got to hold, hold both of my parents' hands at their death. Did it matter if one of my parents was a Trump supporter? No, that's insane. So if you want to have deep relationships, start with the conversations, try the techniques, be willing to admit 
that you made a mistake if you did. Be willing to revise your belief. If you want other people to revise their belief, you have to be willing to revise yours. And if all else fails, let friends be wrong. All right, thanks. We have a few questions. Hello, and thank you for the talk. Um, I want to address what I think is the elephant in the room. Would you please explain how a toilet works? Uh, a very reasonable question. Um, I have no idea how to. I would place my confidence at that in a two. I honestly do not know how a toilet works. I have oh. a, the most vague of ideas. In your view, what do you view as being more important? People getting along or people finding the truth? That's a, a great question. That's much easier to answer than the last question. <laughs> um, I don't think that those are discrete categories of things. Um, I would say that the truth is always the most important. The truth should be the North Star of every organization, of every institution, the guiding principle in your life. Often, to, and there's no but or however there, often to get to the truth, we need to engage veins of literature, people who disagree with us, things that don't comport with our comfort zones in life. So I think that, and I'm not saying that you should use somebody who has different beliefs as an instrument for you to find the truth, but I, I in, no but, I butted myself. Uh, and I have found in my life that those kinds of engagements, like for example, I've, when I've engaged my Christian friends, it's been incredibly useful to me. Because I've come close, I'll give you one example of this. Um, one of the things that I've learned from engaging Christians for so long is when they say, when an atheist and a Christian says, you believe in the, ba you don't have any evidence for what you believe. They don't believe, well, some people do, but the vast majority of Christians simply don't believe that. What the problem in that communication is, is that they believe that the evidence they have is sufficient to warrant their conclusion. But not only that, it's sufficient to warrant their confidence. But I would never have understood that, gotten to that realization, if I didn't engage like thousands, tens of thousands at this point of Christians who I slowly figured that out. So I think they're related, but truth is always more important, always. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Hey, so uh, I, there's obvious value in talking to people we disagree with, but you've mentioned, for example, if somebody says that the US is more patriarchal than, than Saudi Arabia, maybe they're not worth talking to. So in objectivism, there are these like three axioms which are considered so basic and so self-evident that Peikoff says that basically it's not worth having a serious discussion with somebody who denies them. Where do you think is this line? When is it, wor when is it worth or not worth to discuss deep topics? With yeah, th that's why I said it's a deeply personal thing for when you want to have a conversation. I find those fascinating. Um, and one of the reasons I find it fascinating if somebody, the most fascinating, um, I'm a little sick of it now, but I find fascinating the move that we see now constantly to lived experience. When people resort to lived experience, it's not just, just that it's floating out there. It's tethered to a bunch of other propositions about pronouns and it's about the world. I find those conversations extremely interesting, but just because I find them interesting doesn't mean you should find them interesting. The reason that I find them interesting is it because it, it enables me to plumb their epistemology. In the book, I give an example of something that happened to both myself and a former colleague. Um, Excuse me, somebody was asking me to explain something super basic in the philosophy department, and, and I explained it to them. And the, a person who was there who overheard the conversation say, if a white man told me one plus one equals two, a white heterosexual man told me one plus one equals two, I wouldn't believe him. Uh, I have a whole chapter in the book of how to deal with that. But I find that to be the beginning and not the end of a conversation. So there are things that you can say, oh, well, if, would you fly in a plane if the pilot was a white heterosexual male? Again, it's always a question, right? It's, it's never a statement that's stupid, that's wrong. That doesn't build a golden bridge. That increases the defensive posture and makes it less likely that someone revise the So it's a personal thing. I like it. I'm not telling you you have to like it, but I find those conversations extremely interesting. Thanks. 
Thank you for an amazing talk. Uh, uh, Ayn Rand herself said that she doesn't have beliefs, she only has convictions. What I found lacking in your speech was the term conviction. Where would you draw the demarcation line between the belief and conviction? So let me translate. This is a, I love giving. I love giving heresies at places. I, I don't even really consider myself a, a heretic. I mean, a, an atheist so much as an infidel. This is the title of Ayan's book. Um, whenever I hear the word conviction, I translate that in my head as like if I if I hear a, I am a man of conviction. To me, that translates as I am a man who's sufficiently wedded to my belief, unshakably wedded to my belief, and I'm not willing to change on the basis of evidence. To me, the word conviction is a moral term and not an epistemological term. I do not have any convictions. If, I guess if you had to have, you know, I guess if I had to have one conviction, it would be what I said to the last questioner is that uh, truth should be the North Star. I think convictions are a weakness. Thank you very much. Um, your talk was very helpful in, uh, in conversations with people who are receptive um, to having a conversation, but there is an increasing number of people in today's culture who think violence is an acceptable response Correct. to being offended, such as uh, correct. the Will Smith incident or punching a Nazi, the concept of punching a Nazi. 100% correct. How do you approach that attitude. Yeah, th th thank you so much for asking that. Okay, so that I didn't mention this talk, but I absolutely should have. Uh, if you ever feel that you're in a conversation with someone that has the possibility to escalate to violence, leave. And No, I mean, for real, like leave and leave toward a group of people, which is just, by the way, I'll put a plug for it, which is why everybody should be doing jujitsu. <laughs> Uh, but that's really important. So if you're in a conversation with someone and you ever, ever feel that there's a possibility that it could escalate, but I will tell you a very simple, this is in the book. So this is a little morally murky, so we almost didn't put it in the book. So I, I'm going to limit what I'll tell you, but there's a little kind of, there are things that are very close to Jedi mind tricks that you can do to someone. Uh, one of those is called altar casting. So I've altar casted, I don't know, thousands of people at this point, but altar casting is like a mind control trick that you can do to someone. It's so, so simple. It's so simple that you just, people say, oh, it doesn't work, it works. I'm telling you, I've done it thousands of times. So if you altar cast somebody, it must be like a weird quirk of evolution or some kind of a hiccup or something, but you're casting them in a role unbewitting to themselves, unknowing to themselves, that they then live up to. I'll give you two quick examples of altar casting. Um, like, let's say someone's texting on their phone. You say to them, oh, wow, this, well, you're a really fast texter. They want to live to the role of being a w really fast texter. I was with my uh, d a daughter, oh, it was my son, it's my son now, and her teacher was, was talking about how the evils of gentrification. Uh, I personally don't believe that, but if I said, well, what's wrong with gentrification? How confident are you in that? I don't have the time. I'm in a line. It's the PTA. So I just alter casted her. Oh, you seem like a person who's really interested in critical thinking. What are you doing to show people the other side of the issue? Oh, well, I'm bleh. She wasn't doing anything, but she just made it up. So you can alter cast people. So here's how I alter cast people in conversations. If I ever think that the conversation is going to escalate or I can see them, I immediately alter cast them. I say, wow, you know, like you seem like a kind of person who's really good at conversations and keeping your cool. <laughs> is that also how you change their minds about something? No, you don't. So alter casting doesn't instill doubt in people. Alter casting is an instrumental technique that you can use. Hi, and how, where's my time, woman? Two. You, you, you were on the ball. You didn't even have to flip that. Hi. 
Hi, uh, thank you for the lecture. I'd like to ask, uh, if you don't mind, I'm asking two questions. The first one is there is a group in, in Brazil of uh, influencers and politicians that they actually, uh, they have been for very long, uh, show that, that they do not believe what they, what they say in, in public. But they have uh, very important influ influences and uh, there has been an approach of exposing those, those people. However, in Brazil, what has uh, have happened is uh, there's a politician, influencer, you, you expose them in the internet and television. They don't know what, uh, they, don't, they know what, they, what they're saying, but they not, do not believe what they're saying. And, okay. and, uh, uh, so what's your question? My, my question is, uh, uh, the cut of followers do not leave them. How, how can I make an approach or change my strategy to, 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 to show uh, after I expose someone is, is wrong and they actually believe they're wrong, how can I change uh, to, to, to get uh, this cut of followers to, to, to follow something else? And if you don't mind making me a second. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'm going to do it. I'm now, I'm just I'm about to do what I actually said that you should do. So let me, on the burden of clarity, on myself, let me understand, I want to make sure I understand yes. the point. One minute. You're very good. Um, you, you mean, what do you do when having a conversation with somebody and you know that they're disingenuine? Yes. Okay, so he gave yes. I was looking for, yeah, that's right. Okay, I'll take yes. Um, well, it depends what your goal is. So in chapter two of the book, we talk about the, one of the most important things in a conversation is to figure out what your goal is. And you'll find you know, when you teach for many years, you'll find that people will say something to you, or they'll ask a question, not because they want to know the answer, but for some other reason. They want you to know that they know, there's a hot girl or boy or whatever next to them, and they want to date. Who knows why people could be asking any question, right? So um, you'll find if you get people one-on-one, -on -one, it might be very different, but if there's an audience, it's very difficult. That reflection is very difficult. Do I have time for one more or no? No? Okay. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you.